leadership is a participatory sport. It's not actually a numbers game, it's a people game. We're gonna get there, I, we will, and it's probably sooner than we think. Welcome to A Seat at the Table, a podcast for public service professionals by public service professionals. This podcast series is presented by Statewide Learning Services, a division of the Office of Management and Enterprise Services. Taking her seat at the table today to discuss crisis leadership is Shelly Zumwalt, Interim Director of the Oklahoma Employment Security Commission. We are here um, at our podcast, A Seat at the Table, with Shelly Zumwalt, and we're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. I can only imagine what your schedule looks like, so the fact that you've taken the time out to do this with us is fantastic. And we're here to talk about crisis leadership, and I first want to start by you just letting us know your background. Where, What leadership experience have you had prior to where we are now? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is um, super exciting that there's this forum to talk about these issues, because I think that in in state government, a lot of times we deal with something and we move on and, you know, the lessons learned there, sometimes there's not that retrospective that will, um, you know, allow us to learn from them. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that while the state, you know, handles this current economic and unemployment issue, we can look back on it and learn lessons and make improvements so that when we encounter, you know, our next challenge, we are not having to learn the same lessons all over again. Um, my experience is interesting. I've been in state government for about a decade now. Um, I originally started off as a television reporter reporter, which has really been helpful in my current position. Um, in government, I started out as a budget analyst. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting, when people find that out, they're like, what? That, you know, how'd you, how did that happen? And um, I love policy. I love it so much. Um, it is a, it's so interesting to me. And as a budget analyst, I got to look at laws and make recommendations and look at financial impacts or even unintended consequences <laughs> of legislation that was really super interesting to me. And, you know, I could geek out for hours on. Uh, from there, I moved into being the PIO for OMES and then um, did some communications uh, work for Health Choice, our health insurance provider, and then became the director of OMES Public Affairs, ran our public affairs department, and also worked for Governor Fallon's office as her public affairs director. And that was such you know um, important experience to have because that perspective from that office of all of state government is something that I utilize even today. Because I think at state agencies a lot of time get their little lane and don't realize that actually this does affect other branches of government. It does affect other agencies. And how do we holistically look at that and say, is are my actions going to benefit the state as a whole, or is this going just going to have a minimal impact for my agency? And so that's that's kind of my my very long version of my career. Um, now at OESC, well, actually I forgot one position. Um, a couple of them. Now that I think about it, I um, when I was public affairs director at OMES, I actually, after that, I went on as chief of communications at Healthcare Authority. And um, then while I was there, Steve Harp became the director of OMES. And meeting Steve was one of those leadership moments for me because he is such an impactful leader. Um, I Every day he says something or does something that I'm like, okay, file that back because that is good leadership right there. And so um, right before I came to OESC, he um, named me as his chief of innovation and I got to serve in that role at OMES. Yes, prior to OESC. And um, that was that was invaluable as well, even if it was a short time. When the opportunity to serve as the interim director of OESC was presented to me, um, I am going to be real, truthfully honest and say I did not immediately sign up. I had to think about it because it is a huge challenge, but I would not have taken it if I didn't think that I could fix it. Thank you. Thank you for that. So that's your history. Talk to me about right now as the interim director over OESC in the midst of this crisis. What are some of the things that you've learned so far? I don't know if that list is ever going to end, to be honest with you. Leading through this crisis has been really interesting and also one of those things that you have to manage minute to minute. We have a lot of moving parts and a lot of partners in the state and making sure that everything is working the way it's supposed to. And the decision we made two hours ago, is that still the right decision right now in this moment is, is something that is constant and also necessary because the, the situation is always changing. We have people showing up at our um, different offices. We have 27 offices all over the state. And then we are out now using the Will Rogers 
Rogers Building as a claims processing center because people are coming here and we want to serve them. But um, leadership during a crisis, I think, is I, when you first approached me about it, I was like, me? <laughs> because I definitely <laughs> consider this a crisis. But at the same time, it's it's one of those things that I think the, the look back is going to be really important. But um, learning those lessons to the maximum degree when you can is also like soaking it in, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm sure I'm going to make mistakes. I mean, I'm, I know I already have as far as, oh, I wish I would have done that. But like learning that, cataloging it and saying, hey, that needs to be impactful. I don't want to do that again, has been really something that I have to concentrate on because there's different personalities. There's different partnerships that I'm like, why do we do? Oh, we do that because it's law. Okay, good. <laughs> We will do that. You know, <laughs> that's the piece of it. And then the other one that's unique to OESC is that federal partnership, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm um, working with the Department of Labor and you know other offices within federal government has been something that honestly I've worked with peripherally a little bit um, or adjacent or parallel to in the governor's office. But this has been a, a wholly different relationship, and um, navigating that has been uh, the learning curve to that's been a lot to take in as well. Thank you for that. So you mentioned the day-to-day -day and making the decisions. Talk to me about what decision-making looks like. What, how is it different now in this role versus decisions that you've made in past roles outside of this pandemic and the unemployment crisis and the things that are happening right now? Yeah, that's actually a great question because I think um, at OMES, we are a, a central service provider. But that being said, there are roles that have a lot of citizen interaction at OMES. And when I was at Healthcare Authority, definitely, I had some of the same constituents at Healthcare Authority are also the people I serve at OESC. But there is an immediate impact to our claimants or the citizens of the state. And that's a, that's a little different take than I had at OMES because we're a little bit like one removed, right, when we right. are from the citizen experience. And I am talking to people every single day at OESC when we are processing claims and we're um, doing it down in the concourse theater at the Will Rogers building. I'm going down there multiple times a day talking to people and saying, hey where did you go sideways? What part of the website is hard to you? What has your experience been? People, they, first of all, they want to talk to you. They want to know that someone is listening. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing. Um, and secondly, it's been really beneficial for me to make decisions because getting that feedback from that perspective, as well as the administration's perspective, as well as my staff's perspective has been, I have to take all of that and weight it however is appropriate for a decision. I think that also when you communicate those decisions, sometimes you just have to make sure you say, I know that if you were in my position, you would have chosen differently. And I understand that. And I understand this has an impact on you. But at this point, looking at the landscape, I've got to go with X mm -hmm. because I think that's the best decision for today. Um, and also I'm looking at this long-term decision that if we do this, it will have an impact two, three weeks down the road. And honestly, with this situation specifically with COVID, I'm always in the back of my mind thinking, well, as the cases rise, like what if we're in a situation we were in in April again? Like how does this, how do we mitigate that? And yes. I don't know if, if I have an answer, how we do that holistically. If I did, I would be probably, <laughs> I, I would give you my magic bottle, but um, that's always in the back of my mind, right. right? Because we are making decisions for right now, minute to minute. But that being said, that what the next couple of months looks like could vary so widely. And I don't know if as a nation and a state and even as an agency, if we've ever had that completely up in the air, we can't really plan for mm -hmm. what's going to happen. We have to be ready to pivot really quickly. Absolutely. Making decisions in a place of uncertainty requires a lot of flexibility and adaptability. It does. Definitely. So you mentioned earlier about making mistakes. Talk to me about failing forward. How do you how do you stay confident and motivated in the midst of what could feel like constant learning curves and, and making mistakes and failing forward to in order to learn and move forward? Yeah, that's a that's another great question. Um, I think that immediately what comes to mind for me is a, I think I have an asset that not everybody has, but they don't necessarily need it in, in whatever role they're fulfilling. But I, I actually really like change. Um, we went through kind of my career. I've only been in state government for under 10 years, and I've had, I think, 11 different positions within that, which is kind of like, what? That's crazy. I, if I was looking at me, I'd be like, what's wrong with her? But um, it's because I've been able to to jump into roles that needed a quick decision maker, crisis manager, and then once that's fixed, jump out. And I think that has really well prepared me for this. As far as failing forward, you know, I think every time I enter into a new situation, which has happened 11 times now, I've, I've gotten more 
my ability to assess the personalities around me has gotten better. And that happens with age too. But the same things I would do at 32, I'm not going to do at 41, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of, your, your rough edges kind of get smoothed out. So I think, honestly, I've been shown a lot of grace in my career because I know there's, if I look back on some of the maybe decisions I made and didn't communicate as effectively as, effectively as it probably would have been necessary or have discounted processes. Mm -hmm. um, I see that with my agency right now, right? Because they have, They've done a lot of things the same way for a really, really long time. And um, right, wrong, or indifferent, we can't do the same thing in 1980 that we're doing right now in 2020. And I see that in trying to carefully unwind that and deal with the personalities and the, the attachment people have, I think. I am not going to stay in a career for 40 years. Like I've always already proved that. <laughs> but there are people in state government that know they are going to retire at that agency. And for them, that change is really hard. And I, I, I think as I've gotten better at failing forward and assessing the situation and saying, okay, this is this person's safe spot. If I can maintain that or communicate what the change is going to do to that safe spot in a way that they feel like they know what's going to happen next, that learning that lesson and, and using those communication skills to both of our benefit, I think has been probably that learning curve that you look back and you kind of wince and go, oh, I wish I would have done that better. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It, very vital points uh, as far as dealing with the people and the personalities and having to really factor that in in your decision making and how you communicate out those decisions. What would you say to your people right now as they're going through this crisis as a leader of, of individuals who are dealing with a great amount of change? all at once in the midst of a pandemic and, you know, social unrest and all these other types of factors that are happening right now, what do you say to them to keep them encouraged and motivated and focused on moving forward? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the first thing that comes to mind is the people at OESC are just good salt of the earth people. I think that um, we have a situation right now where people are angry and they're dealing with frustrated people every day. And then those people are then getting help and turning around and sending me emails saying, I expected it to be combative or a situation where I wasn't going to be heard and your people have made it so much better than I thought it would be. Right. And so I want to say first that like that is recognized. That is an asset that we have as an agency that is not going to show up on financial statements or KPIs or anything like that. Those things have a place. But the fact that like we turn people that have been feel, feel disenfranchised by this process and then turn them around and say, you know, one lady, um, this was earlier last week, she got her claim fixed and she texted me afterwards and said, and I, she, she just happened to have my number. It's, it's been shared. So it's, I don't want to make, she's not my, my friend per se, but you know, everyone's my friend right now. And, um, she texted me and said, I'd like to buy Sonic drinks for all of your staff. That's been helping with claims. Can you tell me how many I need to bring and what they want tomorrow? That type of situation is what I want to recognize about them and acknowledge that before I talk about, Hey, you're doing a great job, but next year is going to be different because I think that recognizing that there's still something about that place that is needed and necessary and the way that they're conducting themselves will always have a place in that agency. But as for how we do the process, as far as maybe adjudicating claims or processing claims through a system, or even how we deal with the day-to-day -day business of the agency is going to change. And that does not mean that the human factor is not necessary. AI is not meant to replace humans per say. It's meant to free up time so humans can do the things that AI can't. And those are the talking to the person that's crying because she hasn't got her benefits in six weeks. AI can't do that. Everyone has a to-do list, right? And there's always things on that that never get done. And so if we replace aging technology with better processes or automation in that, that's so that we can get to those things at the bottom of the list, not so that we can eliminate a person, right? And so that's that's kind of what I would, we're at the path I would take in, in talking to them about it because we have to change. I mean, change is necessary. Change and in, in the way that the administration views the relationships between agencies, regardless of whether we're an appropriated agency or not, it's all taxpayer dollars, whether they're federal or state, you know, and we need to be able to adapt and change so that we are being a good partner agency to all of the state agencies instead of looking at from just our narrow perspective. It's fantastic. I am such a huge fan of anything that deals with the people piece of leadership, um, understanding that there's so much value. Uh, I really like what you said as far as recognizing the gem that you have and just realizing the polishing that's needed in certain areas. And so I think that that's fantastic.
in the wake of uh, where we are as a country with social unrest, uh, Black Lives Matters, uh, inclusion and diversity, how do you factor in inclusiveness uh, as a whole into the decision making that affects right now and the decision making that goes into the updates, the process changes, the, the people piece of moving forward as an agency? I like that question a lot. And um, I'm going to give you an example of something I did. I think that harkens back to your question before about failing forward and like how I inadvertently sent a message I didn't mean to and like how we corrected that. Cause I think it's an inclusive message. And um, one of the things that we did really early on when I became interim director was we processed a backlog that had been present there. Right. Um, it was necessary. It, you know, we did it quickly and it was something that I knew enough about to be dangerous, and I'm still confident in that decision. But in communicating it, I think I, the message I sent was somewhat was not inclusionary, and it disenfranchised people, and that was not my intention. Um, we we did process the backlog, but the backlog is a moving number. People can go in and out of the backlog week to week. Mm -hmm. You know this because yeah. you work there, right? And it's it's one of those things that um, it's not a static thing that you can say we're done. And in doing that and saying, yes, I hit my goal, I processed the backlog that was there when I started, the message that was sent to some of these people was, I'm not there. You don't know that I'm having problems. You don't know about me. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those failing forward moments where I was like, I need to make sure that if I'm making a statement, it's not exclusionary because these people felt like, uh, what it sent to them was they're not included, mm -hmm. right? And that's never what I want to do. I don't want a single mom that hasn't been paid in eight weeks or that's paid for one week but not seven yeah. to get that message and to say, oh, no, they don't even – she doesn't care about me mm -hmm. because I absolutely do. And that was one of those moments where I – where communication – I think I'm a decent communicator, but I didn't anticipate that. And I found that any time I talk about now, like, the um, pending claims or, you know, so to speak, the backlog, uh, I make sure – sure I say, I know there's some of you out there that this is not your reality, that you are still waiting and we still need to get to you and there's still problems. And I want to be really specific about saying that because right now we have people that are feeling excluded because of race, where they're being excluded because they don't have a job. They're being excluded because they feel like the system isn't working for them. And the last thing I want to do as a leader of an agency that is serving, that is processing almost 600,000 claims is say, you don't matter again. Right. That is not, I never want to do that. I was, you and I know each other outside of, you know, doing the podcast and work. And I was a single mom for eight years. And I know what it feels like when you have someone that you see as being on the inside saying something that then makes you feel like you're on the outside. I, it's happened to me. It, it'll probably happen again. I'm not immune to it, but I definitely don't want to perpetuate that. And I don't want to make a system that's hard for certain people, right? right? It may not be hard for Bob, but it's really hard for Jenny. And then for me to say, well, Bob got help. So Jenny, something's wrong with with you. Right. And that that's that's one of those things that I've really had to I, I don't want to say I walked back what I said because the statement's still true, but it was true and it also made people that were already feeling bad feel worse. And that was something that I learned that lesson. I've been really careful since then because every single person that is should get benefits, that qualifies for benefits, should get benefits. What category they're in doesn't really matter. Right. Another thing that you have some knowledge of since that you, you previously worked there is um, people that we're serving don't really think of themselves in the categories that we do. So when I'm communicating to a claimant, they, if I say, well, are you traditional benefits or are you PUA or some of them know, no, some of them don't. But to them, whatever the pending claims are or the backlog is, that doesn't really apply to them in the way that I think of it. Basically, anyone that hasn't got paid that is due benefits, that's the backlog. It doesn't really matter where in the process they got hung up. And that was another lesson I learned, too, because the way that we were thinking of it was very technically. And in communicating what I did at the very beginning, I realized it, it's not actually a numbers game. It's a people game. And if people don't feel like they're being counted then that's a big issue. And that's the last thing that I want to do is discount people that are already hurting. That's fantastic. I love that. It's not a numbers game. It's a people game. That's who we're here to serve. You're absolutely right when you say that people don't categorize themselves. There's a level of knowledge and understanding about a system for me as an outsider that I'd have to understand to even know where I fit. And so when you have people who are helping, your staff who are helping these individuals, 
How do you get that message down the ranks so that they're communicating it out to the people and not separating them or categorizing them or even communicating with them from that perspective, from their internal perspective, but reaching the customer where they are in their knowledge base? You know, I think that this question specifically is something that, like, I can't really take credit for per se. I haven't even been there a month. So I think whatever the, you know, customer service lessons that these people, my staff are, you know, communicating is probably more about them as a person than it probably is me as leadership. But that being said, um, I, since the day I started, I've always been really careful to say I'm an advocate for our claimants. I, I do not see them as adversaries. I want the same thing they do. We are on the same side of the fight. And I think me saying that and then talking about people as opposed to numbers has really um, helped my staff to that trickle down effect of, and I don't say that with Reaganomics, um, more, more so <laughs> that I'm communicating something, a value that I have. And that value is we are there to help people. We are not there to make them feel worse or to uh, try to not give out benefits. Um, we are there because there's people that are entitled to benefits that have been lost in the system and we need to help them find a path. And right now, we're dealing with a really big group of people that have never had to deal with unemployment, and that's the PUA group. That is that has been you know a challenge and continues to be a challenge. I think that you asked how do we communicate, how to navigate this to them. I would argue that we haven't effectively done that just yet. We are, and we're figuring out what the needs are, but it's been really difficult to pinpoint this is where this person dropped off, this is why this person didn't finish their application or isn't filing their weekly application attestations. There's so many points in that process where we're, we're losing people and we're hitting them one by one, right? We're getting those people, we're educating them. But we live in a time right now where people don't answer their phones. I mean, in, in the way that we're trying to communicate, the, the whole phone thing, it still mystifies me because I don't think that that's actually an effective way to communicate with people anymore, but it is really what we have. Some people don't check their email. We're, we're, we've got a lot of ways that we're trying to reach people that for whatever reason, reason is hit and miss. And so trying to make sure that we're getting the message to people saying, this is where you're tripping up. Don't do this again. And I think that's where when we're seeing people at our offices, that's where that's actually helping quite a bit is because we have claim agents that are helping people personally. And then we move that person to a computer and say, now you do it. And that person stands with you, watches you do it. And I think can we do that with every single person? No, that the volume we can't. But that being said, that model, mm -hmm. I think, is one we can replicate because it's it's a moving target for each person. Discharge, that, that's one of those labor words. Were you discharged? And I think during COVID, people don't think that means you were fired. Absolutely. They, Absolutely. They're like, well, yeah, I was. Or, or um, you know, are you, are you looking for work and are you able and available? That's another one where mm -hmm. when you hear that, you're like, oh, okay, well, they're asking me, would I accept work if it's available to me? But some people's jobs have not returned and they're not available. And I think those are kind of, those are the challenges that we're having to hit, not on a, hey, let's mass email people. We can still do that. We can still try to call people. We can still do all of that stuff. But I think it's been proven that we also need, there's a secret sauce there. There's another group of group of people or avenue that we need to figure out to reach these people, or we're never going to get out of the cycle of thousands of people needing assistance every single week Absolutely. because they're going to keep making the mistakes and they're going to be our frequent flyers that can never master the system. And so that, I think, is a really long answer to your question about systems and people and everything is that... There's not really one right answer. There's not really one way to communicate with all these people. It's a it's a, an array of ways. And how do we do that with maximum impact? And I think we've got some things that are in the works that will have that maximum impact. But like anything, you know, you have to manage the day to day. And then on top of that, plan for something that's going to have a really big effect. And juggling that has been a challenge as well. But we can do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. What would you say to other state leaders that are having to learn on the fly, trying to figure out how to manage their staff, their functions, move forward, thinking through what to do in the wake of COVID and the aftermath of it. What would you say to those leaders who are trying to figure out how to be more flexible, adaptable, quicker on decision making? 
Well, that's a, that's a, two things come to mind. One is I, if you've emailed me and I haven't emailed you back, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to, I, 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 I feel better about it this week than I did last week, but I'm a um, cl- zero my inbox every day person. And that just I, I'll, laying it all out there, that is not happening right now. But that's okay because if my value is zero inbox instead of managing people in a crisis, then I'll have a clear inbox, but my people will quit. They will not, we won't be serving claimants. We won't be doing all these other things that we really need to be doing. So it, that's the piece of it that I think is a really big lesson and has been for me, honestly, is that you're always making choices. Even if you choose to do nothing, you've made a choice. And figuring out what I can do with that 30 minutes I have in between meetings, what is going to have the maximum impact in that 30 minutes? Is it returning phone calls? Is it organizing an event? Is it checking my emails and trying to return as many as possible? There's always going to be something that's fighting for my time and really prioritizing that having to say no sometimes, having to say no to people I don't want to say no to. That has been a challenge in that I always know how, ma- how much time do I have before the next thing? What are my top 10 things I have to get done today? And then making sure those moments I have in between are devoted to those top 10 things and then anything else that comes and I have time for, I will get to it. Now, am I always successful? No, I'm not perfect. That list, it's like, mm-hmm. it, it's always never ending. But for the most part, that's something that... For me, jumping into this position and immediately having 110% need of my time, I've had to really pick my value system with my hours in the day, however many they are. What do I value? What do I have to get done? And what are the things that if I let it slide just a little bit are going to have a really detrimental impact? Or can I set that to the side and say, okay, I'll carve out time over the weekend to do that? Or that has been for me, someone who um, likes structure and order and, uh, you know, it it really got used to being able to be hyper-organized, you know, so that I could be successful. That's the one thing that I think to other leaders, when you're managing a crisis, it is, if you don't have enough time from the first minute of your day, how are you going to devote that time knowing that you're always going to run at a deficit? And uh, that, that, that for me has been, uh, that's been, it's not been tough, but it's been something that I'm always having to do a temperature check to make sure I'm devoting my time in the right areas. What does self-care look like for you in this process? And how do you, if you encourage your staff, what does that look like for encouraging them to also participate in self-care? Gosh, great question. You're good at this. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. If you if you ever want to be a therapist, I think that um, I would be your first customer because I'm like, wow, self-care. Um, that's I don't... actually where I feel like I'm supposed to be. Like, that's yeah. been the, the what I've been running from my whole life. <laughs> You'd be so good at it. <laughs> You'd be you. so good at it. Um, so self-care, I think it's super important. I think that it gets a lot of um, backlash because sometimes it's, you know, taking a bath and other times it's getting a massage or whatever. But I think like really at its basis is what do you need so that, you know, if you are working a 12 hour day, multiple days in a row so that you don't do something you wouldn't do, right? Absolutely. Like yell at someone or make a bad decision or get angry when really you could have handled it better. I mean, that's kind of, that's self-care to mm-hmm. me, Absolutely. right? Um, for me, it's making sure that I don't, I try to go home by 7.30 every night. I've been moderately successful at that uh, because I do have a husband. I have a daughter. My daughter's 13 and, you know, she needs a mom and she's been really good about it. But me working 16 hours instead of 14 hours probably isn't going to make that much of an impact overall because those last couple of hours, I'm probably not at my best anyway. And I could spend that time eating dinner with my family and recharging that way. Um, another thing that has been really important to me is um, I run, even though I shouldn't because I have knee problems, but I do try to do that four times a week and then work out because for me, I know some people hear that and they're like, oh, that sounds awful. <laughs> and some days it does sound awful, but running for me, that's where I have my ideas and I I think through stuff and it gives me 30, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour to just really say, okay, if I'm going to let my mind wander on how to solve this problem, like, where am I going to end up? And sometimes they're great ideas. Sometimes they're horrible ideas and that's fine. That's great. But, um, getting that time to just kind of disconnect and let your mind not be running, just achieving a really accomplishable goal. If that's running five miles or if that's working out at the gym for 30 minutes, like that for me is kind of the basis of, I'm going to be successful at this, this, therefore I can be successful for the really hard things the rest of the day. I would love to tell you I get enough sleep, but I don't um, <laughs> at all. And for my staff, I think it's, it's also 
it's some of the same things, but it's letting them know that I value that they have those breaks. Like I, I've said multiple times, hey, you don't have to do nine people back to back. Get up, go walk around, go, you know, do something that's not work related for 10 minutes every couple of hours because you need to not hit that all the way to 11 every single day by five o'clock. That's not necessary in order to help people right now. And making sure that we are enforcing, uh, and enforcing is the wrong word, but if 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 I allowed it, I think the, the people that are helping out with claimants right now would work from 745 in the morning to 745 at night. I know they would because Absolutely. they, and making sure that we are scheduling, we are saying, hey, at 11 o'clock, we're giving you 30 minutes, go go do that. You know, like that is because if I don't say it, then they're not going to think they have permission and then it's going to trickle down and then we're going to end up with burnout. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Certified Public Manager Program, a nationally accredited cohort-based leadership program that transforms public service professionals within their management careers. To find out more, visit learn.ok.gov. Music provided courtesy of bensound.com. Until next time, keep on learning.